Ever since starting this channel, I've kind of wanted to do a video on Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. I, as I'm guessing many of you were, was required to read this book in school, and covering it seemed like a natural progression, seeing as I had already covered Great Gatsby, Heart of Darkness, and Wuthering Heights, three other staples in education, so it would make sense to talk about one of the most famous British novels of all time. However, part of the problem with everybody knowing about Pride and Prejudice is that everybody seems to have talked about it. People have talked about the misogyny, the classism. Heck, I've even seen people talk about race in Pride and Prejudice. I scoured the internet to barely find any sources about race in Wuthering Heights, and in Wuthering Heights, it's a central theme to the novel. But in Pride and Prejudice, in which every character is white and nobody explicitly mentions race, I've seen people criticize Darcy for participating in the slave trade, as he likely would have despite there, again, being no explicit confirmation. Pride and Prejudice is just that popular. Anything I could think to cover, you can already find it online. Well, almost anything. Wait right there! What? Professor Du Meril? I haven't seen you since the PragerU video. I thought you weren't around anymore. You just didn't talk about anything interesting for a while. But I actually have a great idea for a Pride and Prejudice video. What? Look, why don't you make your own channel? Oh, come on, you let the commie skeleton make a whole video. I didn't let him do anything. Look, just let me show you, and then you'll see why you should trust me. No, no, no. Ribbit. 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 Reading. Ribbit. The opening line implies gay men can't be successful. Great job, Jane. Ribbit. These parents are tools to their kids. Ribbit. Austin says Michaelmas like it's a real holiday. Ribbit. Scene does not contain a soaking wet Mr. Darcy. Okay, that's that's more than enough. Get out of here. I can't afford to get sued. Sorry about that, everyone. Anyways, I do have an original thought about Pride and Prejudice, one that's not really been tossed around any literary analysis communities, at least to my knowledge. I think that in some way I might have a unique theory here. You see, the novel centers around Elizabeth and Darcy, but it is also heavily concerned with all of the other Bennet sisters. Of course, there's Elizabeth, the irritatingly quick-witted and central to the story, main character, Jane, a seemingly perfect self-insert character, Kitty, a miscellaneous sister who's just kind of there, Lydia, a child that is groomed and then heavily implied to be raped by Wickham, even though we are told that she's the one who has disgraced her family, and then there's Mary, the middle child, the least liked daughter, both Mr. and Mrs. Bennet's least favorite kid, and the one least mentioned. Throughout the novel, we are told that she is plain, not pretty, not talented, not a genius, and not loved. She, despite not being naturally gifted like Elizabeth and Jane, tries harder than any of her sisters, and the book seems to punish her for it. Of her work ethic, quote, Mary, who having in consequence of being the only plain one in the family, worked hard for knowledge and accomplishments, was always impatient for display. End quote. Of her piano playing, quote, Mary had neither genius nor taste, and though vanity had given her application, it had given her likewise a pedantic air and conceited manner, which would have injured a higher degree of excellence than she had received. Elizabeth, easy and unaffected, had been listened to with much more pleasure, though not playing half so well. End quote. Of the fact that she reads a lot, quote, They found Mary, as usual, deep in the study of thorough base and human nature, and had some extracts to admire, and some new observations of threadbare morality to listen to. End quote. Of her general performance, quote, Mary, on receiving amongst the thanks of the table the hint of a hope that she might be prevailed on to favor them again, after the pause of half a minute, began another. Mary's powers were by no means fitted for such a display. Her voice was weak and her manner affected. Elizabeth was in agonies. End quote. Her father humiliates her in front of people twice in the book. Elizabeth can barely contain her contempt for the young woman. She's constantly compared to all of her sisters, and always in a negative sense all four of whom are more well-liked than her, and no matter how hard she tries, she'll never be as smart or as talented as Elizabeth, who everybody loves. She's also the only sister to end the novel unwed. This is pretty intense, and I'm not the only one to notice this. People have been calling out for Mary to get a happy ending for decades, 
There are multiple novels and plays dedicated to telling her story. They often, though, sadly include a handful of things, including her becoming conventionally attractive, learning to conform to society, and almost always finding a heterosexual love interest. I don't really think Mary needed these things to be happy. In fact, I don't think she's unhappy. We never see her say she's unhappy, and aside from total jerks Elizabeth and Mr. Bennet, nobody really expresses disinterest in her. Now you might say I just said otherwise in my quotes, but here's where my perspective comes into play. Elizabeth's attitude fogs the novel's perception of Mary. Yes, Pride and Prejudice is told in the third person, but this is third-person limited omniscient narrator, not complete omniscient. Obviously, the novel needs to see things from Elizabeth's perspective, especially when it comes to characters like Wickham and Darcy. Otherwise, we'd have extremely telling moments in the story with a narrator elaborating on the true motives of these men. Could you imagine what Pride and Prejudice would be like with a know-it-all narrator? Now the story of a wealthy family that was about to lose everything, and the one daughter who had no choice but to marry a man to get them out of it. It's Pride and Prejudice. Elizabeth Bennet had been standoffish to Mr. Darcy, given the fact that he broke off her sister's relationship with Mr. Bingley. She also thinks he screwed over George Wickham. However, and she doesn't know this, because how could she? George Wickham is the one that screwed over Darcy. The fact that she doesn't know this will make this proposal kind of difficult for Mr. Darcy. Okay, yeah, that could have taken some of the pacing out of the novel. See, we rarely get to see beyond Elizabeth's point of view, and this is a good thing, but I believe it's also tainted how we should view Mary Bennet. We're told that Mary is twice as good at piano compared to Elizabeth, but apparently everybody hates her performance and loves Elizabeth's, even though when Elizabeth looks around, nobody else seems to be not enjoying the performance. We're told that Mary is pleased with herself whenever she says something, but again, that's supposition on the part of Elizabeth. Let's look at one of Mary's most famous moments, and one often used to say that she's an unlikable character. The following takes place late in the novel, after Lydia had been taken away by Wickham. Quote, As for Mary, she was mistress enough of herself to whisper to Elizabeth, with a countenance of grave reflection, soon after they were seated at the table. This is a most unfortunate affair, and will probably be much talked of. But we must stem the tide of malice, and pour into the wounded bosoms of each other the balm of sisterly consolation. Then, perceiving in Elizabeth no inclination of replying, she added, Unhappy as the event must be for Lydia, we may draw from it this useful lesson, that loss of virtue in a female is irretrievable, that one false step involves her in endless ruin, that her reputation is no less brittle than it is beautiful, and that she cannot be too much guarded in her behaviour towards the undeserving of the other sex. Elizabeth lifted up her eyes in amazement, but was too much oppressed to make any reply. Mary, however, continued to console herself with such kind of moral extractions from the evil before them. End quote. Let us examine how Mary reacts to this situation. First, she expresses sympathy for Lydia, clearly saddened at what has happened to her sister. Second, she says that they need to be careful on how they interact with men, as you can never tell who is a gentleman and who is a dastard. None of this is wrong, but she's treated both by Elizabeth and by fans of this novel as a demon, just because her speech is unconventional and maybe a little bit less flowing than the other characters. Were Mary a male character, though, I believe she would be adored. Socially awkward, verbose, likes to be left alone, isn't naturally good at anything, but strives to better herself. Instead, she's seen as a nuisance. This is why I believe a lot of the works that seek to correct her lot in life focus on the wrong sentiments. Mary doesn't need to change who she is or find a man to be happy. She's already happy. While I think there is sexism at play here, I also recognize that most Austen fans are women. I believe that other factors play into Mary's despised place in the public eye. She's not conventionally attractive, for one thing, or attractive at all. And for all talk, both men and women will often unfortunately give preferential treatment to those that they find aesthetically pleasing. She also differs from the other sisters in how she behaves, socially. She cannot read facial and body language. She has ritualistic behavior, regularly dismissing social events to either read or practice piano. She has trouble recognizing eye contact. 
Her voice is described as affected, meaning atypical and unusual. She doesn't always acknowledge when people talk to her. I'm not going to say that I have any right to diagnose any character with autism. That would be inappropriate. However, Mary does display characteristics commonly seen in those that are neurodivergent, and I don't think it's surprising that neurotypical audiences don't like this character. My point is, Mary Bennett doesn't need redemption. She doesn't need normalization. If you personally don't like her, that's fine. But let's not say that a woman that didn't marry, didn't fit the pinnacle of beauty, had to practice hours on the piano to be any good, and was oddly verbose, is necessarily to be looked down upon, especially since all of those characteristics can be applied to Jane Austen as well.